Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 23rd of August. Now, there's a lot of variation in reporting around the world on rates of myocarditis after COVID vaccination. And I'm particularly concerned about this at the moment because we've just been looking at the huge expansion, huge, ma massive expansion of mRNA vaccine production around the world, a new plant in the UK to produce 250 million doses a year, 100 million doses in Australia, 100 million doses in Canada, in addition to what's already produced in the United States for a wide variety of different vaccines. So we really need to look at what we know from mRNA vaccines in the past to work out if this is a good idea for the future. And this is why I'm really concerned about the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration. Now, what they've just said is that the rates of myocarditis following COVID vaccinations are stable. We, we know they happen, it's a stable amount. They put it at a very low amount, which we will be contesting, but it's a stable amount. So what they've said is, well, you know, it's stable, so we don't need to bother reporting it. <laughs> it's just incredible. <laughs> I'll give you the evidence for this in just a second. So because the rates are stable, it can be ignored. This is a bit like saying, well, um, deaths are stable, everyone dies, so we'll just ignore it or deaths from drug overdoses are stable, so we'll just ignore those, or the number of new cases of cancer are quite inevitable, so we'll just ignore them, or deaths from road traffic accidents are inevitable, so let's just ignore it, let's not report on it. It's utterly bizarre that they would say this. And let's, let's hope the Australian senators, and we know quite a few of the Australian senators are very vocal about this, rightly so, Let's hope they challenge this apparent nonsense from a national organisation. Let's look at it now so you know I'm not just making this up. So here we have it here. This is the uh, Australian government, Therapeutic Goods Administration. Uh, my myocarditis is reported in around two of every 100,000 of those who receive Moderna. Now, <laughs> we'll be giving evidence that this is, uh, shall we say, um, a conservative estimate. We'll be giving estimates that are massively higher than this in a minute. But we'll let that pass for now uh, and uh, stick to the point. And this is, a, this is directly from their website. Really quite incredible. Uh, as reporting rates of myocarditis and pericarditis following vaccination are very stable, we will not include this section in future COVID-19 vaccine safety reports. Unbelievable. So uh, I, I'm, I'm just... Uh, well, I've given you those ludicrous analogies before. It's just quite incredible. And uh, let, let's hope the people of Australia don't put up with this nonsense that because it's regular, it doesn't matter. Well, if I, if I was one of those people with the myocarditis, it would certainly matter to me. I just, I just find this incredible, as I'm sure you do. Um, however, we continue to monitor and review these uh, adverse events and we'll communicate any update updated safety info, uh, advice if needed so yeah we know this is happening and i tell you what we're going to keep an eye on it we're not going to tell you what it is but trust us we'll tell you if you need to know patronizing unbelievable for, for a modern sophisticated western democracy anyway there we have that um now the the australian uh department again the tga this this is their safety report here check it out for yourself um, they're still recommending the primary course of vaccines for people over the age of five. Now, in the United States, they're still recommending a primary course of vaccines for everyone aged over six months. Unbelievable that they will be vaccinating healthy six-month-old children in the United States. Absolutely incredible, but that's what the recommendations still advise. In Australia, they're recommending it for over five. Now, in the United Kingdom, it's not. We stopped primary vaccinations June, July this year, we don't do it at all, primary vaccination courses now. So why is it that it's necessary in Australia over the age of five, necessary in the United States over the age of six months, but not necessary apparently in the United Kingdom? Are we so much safer here in the United Kingdom than you are in Australia or the United States? These inconsistencies really do not make any sense why would they still be recommending primary vaccinations in australia for everyone over five and everyone over six months in the united states really really is very very strange i would have thought anyway back to australia uh, people aged over five years to protect against uh, or older to protect against covid19 
So five and six year olds are at such risk against COVID-19, even now after three years of uh, expo- presumably exposure, ongoing exposure to the virus. They're at such risk, they still need COVID-19 vaccine to protect themselves. It's just quite incredible that these recommendations haven't been updated. Uh, for most people, a primary course of uh, took t- consists of two vaccines. Now, the TGA, adverse reactions here, these are their figures here. They say two reports per thousand doses of vaccine. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's what's reported. 139,157 adverse events. Now, to put this into context, we did talk to Senator Rennick, uh, Senator for uh, Queensland in, in Australia, and he estimated that the uh, these adverse events are underreported, perhaps to the tune of 90% or more. So, as you'll see, these represent, shall we say, minimum figures. The risk-benefit analysis has changed. The guidelines don't seem to have changed. This is the problem. So, this is their adverse, one adverse event per 490 doses given, 0.2%. Now, we do have some good data from Western Australia. Again, under-reporting there is rife, but we've got some good data, and we did look at this recently. So, let's just remind ourselves, in Western Australia, it was uh, two, uh, zero point. Uh, 241 so higher than the national rate according to this data now what we did look at in western australia was this graphic and what this graphic showed here was the increase in the reporting of adverse reactions the blue line is when covid vaccines were introduced so here we have adverse reactions from previous vaccines we introduce the covid vaccines and the rates go up quite massively and of course you correctly respond well, just a minute, we were giving a lot more COVID vaccines. You know, they were given two or three times more vaccines than they were before. But but uh, it's still the case that um, 97% of the adverse reactions reported were COVID vaccines. And it works out, I worked this out myself, it is correct, that adverse reports per vaccination, per vaccination after the COVID vaccines, 21 times more common than conventional vaccines. So we have these conventional vaccines, basically mushed up dead virus antigenic particles that we generate immunity. Why would we want to leave a tried and trusted technology for a technology that is not tried and trusted, that people are very suspect about, uh, suspicious about, and we've got good physiological reasons to believe that these new mRNA vaccines that are going to be coming on stream um, are probably going to have the adverse reactions that the COVID vaccine had. In fact, almost certainly, in my view, will. Why are we going full steam ahead for this mRNA technology when it's completely unproven as we are? Influenza vaccine, respiratory syncytial virus vaccine going on to mRNA. What I do agree with is is the cancer vaccines because, you see, people that have got cancer I've got a significant risk of death. So to have an mRNA type vaccine there against their cancer is really quite a good idea. So if I, if I had um, a reasonable chance of dying of cancer, I'd jump at the chance of an mRNA vaccine against that cancer. But it's not the same for healthy people who are at minimal risk of things like influenza and respiratory syncytial virus and COVID. Um, it doesn't make sense. So let, let's keep these mRNA vaccines for people that are ill not people that are well, then we're doing no harm. And, and then the risk that we're taking and giving them is, is massively, massively outweighed by the potential huge benefit uh, for a patient with cancer, for example. It's a completely different situation. It's, it's, it's like any other uh, cancer treat, treatment therapy. You don't give it to people that are well. You give it to people that are sick. Anyway, getting back to the point, uh, 21 times more uh, adverse reactions than conventional vaccines. Now, the rate of myocarditis, so the Australians are saying the rate of myocarditis is 2 per per 100,000 doses. Let's look at some other research now that indicates it's slightly higher than that, hundreds of times higher than that, in fact. European Journal of Cardiology, Um, myocardial injury after COVID-19, mRNA vaccine booster vaccination, Um, that they adjudicated at 2.8%. So not two per 100,000, 2.8%. Now, this brings up the issue of how this is diagnosed. Now, the diagnosis here in this Swiss study was elevated troponins, these, these 
markers that are released from inflamed uh, or dead myocardial cells. Now, to be completely clear about the science here, the myocardium can be temporarily inflamed and release troponin. So an individual myocyte, an individual contractile heart cell, can be inflamed for a period of time, release troponins, and then completely recover. So let's be clear that complete recovery is absolutely possible here. But of course, people that have raised troponins, it doesn't tell us how many are going to be left with cardiac scar, but complete recovery with low levels of troponins is completely possible. So that is reassuring. But of course, in this Swiss study, they, they looked at the troponins and then they advised not to exercise if the troponins were raised, which is what we are not doing in the United Kingdom, for example. But taking troponins, um, and we fully accept that we, we would hope all of these, but and sadly we know that it won't be all reversible, but it can be fully reversible. Group of 777, 2.8%, 1 in 35 had vaccine-associated myocardial injury. Match controls um, didn't, and the difference there was only one in a, in a, only one chance in a thousand that that result arose by chance. So let's be quite clear. People that have had temporary myocarditis after COVID vaccine, in principle, can make an utter, complete recovery. That's important to emphasise. We don't want people to be getting worried here when they don't need to be. But at the same time, if people have raised troponins and they've got myocarditis and then they go exercising, then that would concern me. So what they did with this uh, Swiss study was they advised people just to not do some exercise while their troponins went down again. And that most of the, everyone there, the troponins did go down. and No one in that study died, but they were advised not to exercise. So... Um, Big, big difference there. But let's be clear, full recovery after troponin release is at least theoretically possible. And let's hope that this is happening in the vast majority of cases. Thai study that we looked at, this was, was in uh, adolescent boys, 18 to uh, 13 to 18 years of age. Uh, rel relatively small sample size, but again, 2.33 had elevated biomarkers. Uh, two patients had suspected pericarditis, four patients had suspected subclinical myocarditis. And uh, that means basically we need to monitor these people. So, and of course, we're not monitoring troponins. The reason that we know there's troponins indicating myocardial inflammation in these studies is because we look for it. Most of the time we are not uh, looking for it. That is the uh, difference. And I think we have one more study here. Oh, the Israeli study, that's right. Again, um, the Israeli study showed uh, it was a lower amount, I think. Chest pain in quite a few after the vaccine. Palpitations in quite a few. 3.7% uh, for chest pain, 2.16% for pal palpitations. Vaccine-related myocardial injury in two, which was 0.62%. And again, this was adjudicated by elevated troponins. And a full recovery is possible after that, at least in theory. Now, um, the risk-benefit analysis here, um, a few days ago we looked at the interaction between the chief executive officer of Pfizer and Rand Paul, uh, American senator, of course, and uh, he was quite clear that he submitted six papers to the Senate uh, committee indicating that the risk of myocarditis in these adolescent boys and young men is greater after the vaccine than if they'd had the natural infection. So the risk from the vaccine is uh, greater. Now, what is bizarre is that the guidelines in the um, Australia and the United States are treating adolescent boys and 20-year-old young men the same as 85-year-old women. Again, why don't they bring these uh, recommendations um, up to date? Quite inexplicable. Um, but... There we have it. They're just, just reporting what, what's there. United Kingdom, a little better, but again, somewhat disingenuous, you get the impression. This is from the United Kingdom data. Um, so th these are the uh, numbers of adverse reactions after Pfizer, total of 1,430. Following Moderna, which tends to be worse, 1,530. Uh, sorry, 1,430 for the Pfizer uh, 1,530 for the Moderna, but that's only as of November 2022. So 
British government data pretty well out of date, but um, that's what we have. Um, 10 reports per million, one report per 100,000. Again, British data saying one incidence of myocarditis per 100,000. Swiss data saying over over 2%. Thai data saying over half a percent. There's a great inconsistency here, meaning that most cases of elevated biomarkers are simply not being picked up. Um, for most people, the inflammation would simply go away. But to me, to exercise with myocarditis is a really, really dangerous thing to do. And let's just check if the British guidelines are taking that into account. If there's suspicion of myocarditis, pericarditis. So the British government are quite good saying, well, yeah, you need a 12 lead ECG. You need all your blood markers done, your inflammatory markers. And of course, you should do your troponins. But that's only if there's suspicion. Do you see the difference here? They're only seeing if you're suspicious. suspicious. Now, that means that, first of all, the person would realise that there's a connection with a vaccine. It also means that they found a clinician that was prepared to do these tests for them. And of course, many people who uh, might have minor symptoms might not relate it to the vaccine. That's one of the reasons why they're such underreporting. For the British data, the all-party par all parliamentary group that we looked at uh, last week or the week before indicated that our yellow card scheme in the UK is so pathetically rubbish that it could be only picking up 2% of adverse reactions. Absolutely incredible. That was from the all-party parliamentary group that we reported on uh, last year. Even if we're picking up 90%, even if we're picking up 10%, we're still losing 90%, but it could be we're only picking up 2%, missing 98%. Time for this scheme to be updated, one might think. So it says looking at opponents, and then incredibly... Uh, if there's no evidence of ongoing myocarditis, vaccine may be considered with the vaccine 12 weeks after the last dose. So what is what they're saying here? In the UK, if you've had the uh, the vaccine, mRNA vaccine, you've had a bit of mild myocarditis. If you're symptom free, 12 weeks after that, you can have a, another dose of vaccine. What, th this is just incredible. The idea that, I mean, it, it, suppose someone was allergic to, I don't know, penicillin. And what we do is we, we get your pen out and write allergic to penicillin on, on the drug sheet. So it can't possibly be given again. We have red stickers that go on it. But here we're saying, well, you've had a bit of myocarditis. That's OK. Just wait to recover and then have another dose of vaccine. What, 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 why, 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 why would they go against such established principles in medicine just because this is a COVID vaccine? Um, this is one of the anomalies that's really quite... Uh, well, irritating is the probably kindest way you can you can say it. Um, and a again, if the individual feels well after receiving COVID vaccines, then there's no need for preemptive restrictive measures on exercise. So, if you have the vaccine and you've got chest pain, then okay, that you should you should um, rest. But they're saying if you had the vaccine and you feel okay, then go and run marathons as normal. That's fine. When there's a risk of myocarditis in two point whatever it is percent from the Swiss study, 2.6% or whatever, well over 2% from the Swiss study. To me, these British government guidelines uh, make about as much sense as the Australian government guidelines, but they're what we have, but don't let me influence you. You decide uh, what you think. I've given you the uh, evidence. Um, sadly, more to come on this when mRNA-type vaccines are given for other things than COVID, which we know are currently being developed. Serious question marks, I think, for the huge investment. For example, we believe the British government's put a billion dollars into these new uh, mRNA vaccines. We believe they're committed to buying them for the next 10 years, whether they work or not, whether they're dangerous or not. Hey-ho, never mind, we're going to buy them anyway. Very, very, very strange goings on. It's almost as if there's some confusion or ambiguity between the financial interests and the medical interests really i think government should uh, clarify that this is not the case but don't wait with bated breath for now thank you for watching